Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Rudy Ebersold, and it's a pleasure to come and give a talk in this, uh, in this course. So we have now done this course several times, several times, and it kind of keeps evolving. But it, um, I think generally it's considered a very productive course because there's a lot of practical uh, components in a very lot of practical teaching. So that practical teaching is not coming from me. So I'm just coming to give kind of an overview. And then on Friday, I'm coming back with uh, some applied stories. But in between, there's a lot of uh, detailed teaching on uh, the practicalities of um, targeted proteomics, specifically related to, da to data analysis. So uh, I'd like to start out by making a couple of general remarks about why we thought this course is necessary and fulfills a purpose, and then make, uh, make a few comments about the field in general. So um, we, we, we think that, uh, that there is a fundamental change occurring in proteomics field from the discovery proteomics, which is still, of course, extremely widely used and provides highly relevant data uh, to um, to, to a field where we uh, can ask specific questions by targeting. And we also recognized that uh, these targeting methods require a, a bit of a different mindset from the experimental design point of view, but also from the way the data are being analyzed. And so we will learn about a number of technical developments uh, PRM, DIA, SWOTH, uh, SRM. Uh, these are just terms which will, ha will, will become very meaningful to you during this week. And these data, uh, these, all these methods generate specific types of data. And to ana the, ana the analysis of this data has, brings new challenges and, and require a little bit of a different mindset. So there's tools that support this analysis, but I think we also would like to talk about some of the, of the principles in this course, and then the tools that implement these principles. So we also observed that, um, this is not just us, but this is the field in general, observed that where most proteomic studies fail if they actually fail, or, or if there's problems, it's at the level of computation. So there, this is just one example of such a study that documents these factors. This is a study that was done by John Bergeron. I should have actually added the, the reference. Oh, it is there, but not, it is on the screen, but not. Uh, well, anyway, it's, a, it's the, the, the last author is John Bergeron from, from Montreal. And they undertook some years back um, a study where they sent a sample to a number of laboratories who agreed to participate. And the sample was a contrived sample, it's not even a proteome, it was a, a contrived sample of uh, 20 human proteins that were mixed together in equimolar terms, in equimolar amounts. And so a number of laboratories here, they uh, agreed to analyze these tools in, in their laboratory with the tools they have available, and then report the data back. And the results were actually pretty abysmal. Um, I think there's only, only one or two laboratories that actually got these 20 proteins right. Now, this was a few years back, but not many years. I think it was about around 2010. And then this, this paper came up for review, and I, I also had to review it, and it went around and around. And then uh, we thought this is really not very meaningful to say people failed. Because it's one thing to, it's like if you do a model and the model fails, this is of course interesting, but you want to know why it failed and where is the discrepancy. So the, the suggestion was made to analyze where did actually these experiments fail, why did, why, did, why did people, these 27 labs, not succeed in identifying 20 proteins at equimolar terms, which by most accounts would be a relatively easy task, especially if you want to uh, take the, have the ambition to uh, analyze whole proteomes, consisting of thousands of proteins. And so the upshot was that when this, the data was analyzed from the point of view of did the mass spectrometer not work, did people not know 
may, maybe not use the right database or where did they fail, it was very, very clear that the failure came mostly at the level of the data analysis. So many of these 27 laboratories were actually able to generate quite good quality results, but they were not able to analyze the meaning of these results with available computational tools. This was entirely based on DDA or shotgun mass spectrometry, um, but the same issue, of course, the issue of how do we extract information from data sets also applies to targeting, and we thought then that we would do a course that de deals with targeting. Uh, with, t with the data analysis part, not so much with data generation, which is actually quite robust. So now this is the backdrop, and now I'm coming to what I'm trying to cover in the next minutes. Why do we measure proteins when genomics works so well? Why do we even go there? Because we all know that we can measure genomes and transcripts with relative ease and relatively low price. Um, I will then discuss briefly discover, discovery proteomics and its impact, and then the targeting for rational and rational uh, targeting MS rationale and implementation, and then uh, exp explore a little bit the expectation that we have to any proteomic method and, and discuss where we think we are with targeting in these regards at the moment. Okay, so let's start with the first question. We all, of course, know that the proteins are carrying out essentially all biological functions and control biological functions. And so it certainly makes sense to focus on the proteins. Of course, the history of protein research is rich and goes long, back a very long time. But we also know that the proteins exist because they, trans they, this, they reflect information that's in the genome. And this is, is uh, transcribed and translated out of the genome into the functional units, which are the proteins. So the idea would com could come up, of course, that we don't really need to do this tedious work with proteins. We could basically do measurements here or here at the mRNA or the no genomic level and then make predictions how the uh, proteins behave. We can, of course, do that by sequence. In fact, in the, in the mass spectrometric world, we use this information that we, that we know that if we determine a bit of sequence here, we can get the whole gene by going back to the genome. But, what, but the sequence, of course, is not all that matters for proteins. What also matters is when they are present, how active they are, and how much of the, these proteins is present. So in the field, if you, if you read through the genomic literature, also in disease-associated literature of uh, genomics, the implication is always, all you have to do is do measurements here at the transcripts or protein, uh, uh, transcript or DNA level, and then you, you would learn basically how the cell functions. We from the protein side would contest this point and say uh, there is complementary information in proteins that we only ob can obtain if we actually measure the proteins. So this is a point of debate, and I don't want to belabor this. It's actually a very complicated issue. Um, but I just want to make a few points that support the notion that we cannot predict how biological systems function from, from nucleic acids alone. This is not an argument against nucleic acid um, analysis, of course. It's, it's, it's an argument for complementary analysis. So just a few um, just a few uh, vignettes in this regard. So a while back we did a study with a group from Jörg Baylor in, in the UK on an organism called S. pompi, single cellular um, yeast basically. Um, it is distantly related to the yeast most people work with and it's actually more distantly related to Cerevisiae. Um, it is more, it's further away from Cerevisiae than Cerevisia is from humans. So this is, it's actually more close to human biology than it is to Cerevisia biology, which is a remarkable fact, which I also didn't know before we talked to Jörg. Um, anyway, it has about 5,000 open reading frames. And we then, in this study, tried to measure as, as best as we could, uh, in absolute concentration terms, the co in copies per cell, the transcripts and the proteins. Of an organ of this organism when it was grown in two di or, or living in two different states. Um, the two states are exponential growth and the dormant state when they do basically nothing. They wait uh, for better, better times when better food comes along and they revive and then start growing again. 
So I don't have time to go through all these uh, do, do all these factors, which actually is a fascinating story, how this, uh, how this organism adapts to different conditions, um, which I don't have to time to discuss. I just have one or two major points. The, if we measured the transcripts, uh, basically, and sell, the, as copies per cell of transcripts, the numbers were exceedingly low. So the average, or the mean rather, is about three copies per cell for transcripts. So uh, we can of course ask why, how does, does the cell manage to make three exactly and not five and not one is another question, but the mean is very low. These are not single cell measurements, of course they're measured in a, in a pool of cells which are in the, in the same state, namely exponential growing. So it's less than three and in proliferate, pro proliferating cells contain a total of about 40,000 um, transcripts. This is a very, very low number. Um, and so the cost, if we compare to proteins, where I'm getting to, uh, in a second. And so one one consideration is simply also the cost. So if a cell has to make 40,000 mRNA molecules, the cost is actually quite low. Contrasting this with the cost of proteins. So the mean number is a logarithmic scale here, and the mean number of proteins is a clo is close to 4,000. So uh, and, and some of the proteins are measured, uh, are, are expressed up to a million copies per cell. So some of the highest expressed proteins ex uh, consume for one single protein type, class, or one protein, um, consume a lot more energy than the whole of the transcriptional landscape for, for the whole cell. So there's a very large, is a much larger dynamic range, much higher numbers, much higher mean. So the number of the, the amount of energy that the cell is uh, has it to, to expand to deal with maintaining and adjusting the protein amounts is enormous compared to transcripts. So we would assume, simply for cost efficiency reasons, that, this, um, that different mechanisms have evolved to control the level of protein and the level of transcript. We can certainly not just go and take this roughly, you see that most of the transcripts are within a very, very narrow range, uh, maybe between between one and, and ten copies per cell, there's some, some that are higher. We simply cannot just go and multiply this number of transcripts with a certain factor and arrive at this distribution. It is a lot of biology underlying the, the, dif the difference, the translation from transcripts to proteins. Um, we can also ask, this was another study in Pombi, how do the cells react? So here the cells were not measured at steady state, but they were basically challenged, and this was oxidative stress, it doesn't really matter what it is. And then in a consortium of laboratories, we measured the behavior of the transcripts and the behavior of the proteins following a very defined stimulus. And what we can see here, so this is a summary of a lot of data, we see that there is many groups or behaviors that are appearing how the cell adapts to this stress, which is a very, def very well-defined stress over time. This is always time axis here. This is a, uh, and then we have um, these are the, the these are the um, protein and and RNA numbers, but it is not really important. The important thing is that the green and the the red curve are uh, the mRNA and proteins respectively. And the the take home message should simply be, without going in any of these patterns, that there is no synchrony between the induced change at the protein and the mRNA level. So while, of course, we can assume that proteins are not generated without having transcripts present, it is clearly so that there's a lot of regulatory events that amplify or buffer or delay the uh, changes that are occurring on the protein level, and we assume that the changes in the protein level are biochemically the relevant ones. So we see, for instance, cases here where the transcripts dip after stimulation, the protein actually goes up and then comes down. We see, a, we see here a pattern where we have a, a relatively moderate increase in the transcripts, a fairly large increase at the level of proteins from almost non-existent to qu quite high. We see cases here which we might expect where the transcript is increased and with a slight delay the protein is increased, but we also see cases where transcripts do stuff and proteins do not and vice versa. 
So I don't want to belabor that. I just would like to point out, I think this is the assumption probably also of most of you who are dealing with protein measurements in some way, that we would, to form a complete picture of biological processes, we would need also to measure uh, proteins, maybe in addition to, um, to, to genomic measurements. The observation how is, however, that so far high throughput biology has almost exclusively been based on transcripts because it's simply more easy to measure and more robust and relatively uh, straightforward also from a price point of view. So now we would like in the field of proteomics we would like to change that based on the comments I just made that we would like to gather additional or complementary information. The question is how do we do it? Um, I think we all would assume that this has somehow to do with mass spectrometry um, and now I make a few comments about discovery proteomics and its impact and then some rationale for targeting and this is the theme of this week. Um, tar uh, the DDA or shotgun or discovery proteomics is one flavor of what's typically referred to as bottom-up proteomics and this basically means that we do not measure proteins directly as is illustrated here uh, in as they are illustrated here in this graph but we measure we do measurements at the level of peptides and then these peptides have to be or the data from peptides have to be at eventually reassembled into a statement about proteins I think we have to realize that n virtually no biologist is interested in peptides because they are just basically artifactual intermediate products of our path to making a statement of a protein. What biologists really worry about is how, what is a protein doing or more specifically a specific proteoform, a specific form of a protein for instance splice form, modification form and, and this uh, causes some problems that we are going to briefly address and also will come up later on in the course. So this is certainly not news to you that we digest the proteins into peptides. There is of course a whole alternative world of proteomics and that is to uh, top-down proteomics where scientists try to measure directly uh, proteins, try to infer the quantity and the sequence of intact proteins without going through this digestion step. And this is certainly a very worthwhile field of research but it is really not yet competitive and not re really yet applicable to most biological questions. So right now, I think for better or worse, we're forced to, uh, if you really want to do biology with these techniques, we need, we're forced to worry to deal with peptides. These peptides are then analyzed by various types of mass spectrometers, which I'm sure um, you know. So we do separation, we do um, spray, usually electrospray ionization, and then we generate spectra, uh, precursor ion spectra, and fragment ion spectra that are derived from specific precursors detected in the mass spectrometer. And then these data are, basi are basically being analyzed in some computational platform. So whether we do discovery sequencing or whether we do targeting mass spectrometry, most of these steps are actually the same. We need to do exactly the same sample preparation, same digestion, same separation. The only, we even may use the same mass spectrometer here. We just, the, what, what really matters is how we use this instrument and what it, how, it is, how it is used, with what intent it is used. And then of course, there is substantial differences in the, in the data, data analysis down here and that's the essen essentially the course, the contents of this course. Okay, so if we do bottom-up proteomics, um, in any in any mode of operation, we disassociate the peptides that we actually analyze. This is the currency of our analysis from the proteins. We digest the proteins in a mixture and we lose the connectivity. We sequence then individual peptides through fragment ion spectra, and then we use computational tools to go back from this fragment ion spectra to first state or try to try to try to state which peptide is represented by the spectrum 
and then we somehow try to uh, assemble the proteins based on the peptides identified. So this, all this down here is fairly mature. This one here from, pe from spectra to peptides is fairly mature. The step from here from the identified peptides, assuming they have been confidently identified, back to making statements about which proteins are reflected by these proteins, uh, by these peptides, or how or represented by these peptides, is actually to this day an unresolved issue. No one can no one can stand up and say I've I have identified uh, by shotgun sequencing some 50,000 peptides from let's say a human sample and confidently state that these 50,000 peptides represent a set of proteins. This this protein inference is a complicated issue and it and the result depends on certain assumptions and there is no agreement in the community what these assumptions are nor is nor are there tools that implement strictly these assumptions because all these assumptions well the Im assumptions are implemented but the assumptions may be wrong most tools as attempt to do this inference step by stating that the minimal number of proteins represented by the identified peptides is the list that is reported. But this may not actually be the correct number, it may be the minimal number and the actual number could be larger. And the, the, large, the number could be larger because, uh, or there's no fixed rules or there's no fixed truth in that step, because we don't really know how peptides are related to proteins. And so I try to illustrate this with this graph here. We have a number of peptides. This is a peptide, for instance, was identified from a spectrum, correctly, we presume. And this peptide is uniquely associated with this protein. protein. So we call these peptides proteotypic peptides because they only occur once in the whole proteome. And if we identify this peptide correctly, we can confidently state that this protein is in the sample because there's no other way this peptide could be, could be, um, could be generated. We have, we have, however, also peptides like this one here, where exactly the same peptide is present in this protein and is present in this protein. So let's assume we correctly identify this peptide. We don't know whether protein B or protein C was in the sample or in fact both. We just know um, that we have this peptide and it could be part of B or C. And then we have maybe another peptide that's part of this protein here and part of C. And then we, we need to somehow mix this together in very complicated models to say what we believe are the, uh, the proteins that make the best sense of the number of peptides identified. This is an extremely challenging task and it is not strictly a solved problem because it depends on some assumptions and these assumptions may be, may be actually not correct. So this is one of the big issues in the field of, um, of proteomics. In the targeting method, we to some extent have control over that. Because we can say we only look at peptides, we target only peptides in our analysis that have a unique association between a protein and a peptide. Complicated cases like this one here, which occurs in two or more proteins, we, we might ignore at least at the beginning. So we might focus, we have basically in targeting, we have, a, we have the option to select which peptides we want to measure. In non-targeting shotgun sequencing, we don't have this option because the mass spectrometer makes, makes decisions, basically provides us with a list of peptides that we then have to somehow associate with proteins. So now this is not just a academic discussion, it actually has huge implications for the data um, that this issue, especially the issue of protein uh, inference, but also generally of, the, of, of the computational control of the quality of the data has huge implications on what is reported in the scientific literature. So a while back we, we wrote a, a little review paper where we analyzed um, the, a number of things about the field of mass spectrometry based proteomics. And one thing we analyzed is how many proteins the authors of these articles reported as having identified uh, in their study in the scientific literature over a period of time. 
So this was roughly from 2000 to 2010. And this, the blue curve here, is the number of proteins the, uh, o the authors uh, reported in their paper. So these were all papers that published peer review, that were published in a journal and are part of the literature. So we see that it started very modest with about a couple of hundred proteins in around 2000 and then it went up a lot. And so this is of course a good sign in general because if a field progresses you would like to have more data, bigger data sets and, and uh, basically make progress. But then there was this reduction here, so this dip and then a sus this a sustained recovery uh, that slowly occurred in uh, in terms of numbers of proteins identified. So this is a peculiar finding. Why would people, uh, scientists in roughly 2002, have done better work in, in the sense that they identified more proteins from a sample than those who worked in 2005? Did they become less competent? Did they become lazy? Did they no longer know how to tune their machines? I mean, so one could ask a lot of questions. And what we concluded was that most of this blip here, or this curve, it was actually for wrong identifications. Because roughly around this time, the first statistical assessment of the quality of assignment of the spectra to the peptides and, the, and how proteins are infer inferred from the identified peptides were implemented. And this led, this is our belief, one could debate this, this led to a decrease in number of proteins reported but not a decrease in true identifications, but a, but a decrease in the wrong, erroneous identifications. So this is, and then as a recovery, and then of course now it's gone up again because pro the mass spectrometers have become a lot better. But still, the average number of proteins reported uh, by a study, even today, in a proteomic study is actually not very high. There are of course some, some publications which go to very high numbers, 10,000 or more, proteins identified and that's kind of the um, frontier and I'm coming to the meaning of this frontier just in a second. So the lesson from this was to us um, that one has to be careful with what one reports uh, because there is a propensity at various levels to inflate the numbers reported, um, the, the numbers of proteins identified and reported and that is largely an issue of, of data analysis and software tools and in the field of DDA, the shotgun method, this really has become very, very robust now. I would say in the last half of the last decade, and now I think this is very robust, with the exception of the in protein inference step. And I'll come back to that in a second. So scientists have then, um, if you want to have aspirations to be a omics technology, really measure the whole ohm, in our case the proteome, we should be able to eventually reach that point. And if someone measures 10 proteins, this is not an omics technology. And of course, the genome can be measured completely and robustly. So we can ask, how are we doing in the field of proteomics with measuring whole proteomes? So this is uh, data from a project that we, we had in Seattle. Uh, I started in Seattle in, in about 2001. And that continued uh, since then. And it is basically a community effort to collect all the spectra from that are being generated by scientists, uh, fragment ion spectra of proteins, and then to analyze this spectra with respect to the, the peptides and proteins they represent uh, in a consistent manner. We can make no claim that the, uh, that the results are correct, but at least they are consistent. And they are based on some fairly sophisticated um, um, tools. So this is a data situation. This is from 2000 to uh, when this project started to about now. And this is actually data from Eric Deutsch who heads this project uh, at the ISB in Seattle. And we can see that the community, the scientific community has become very generous to make the raw data accessible. This is a very good sign. So now there's uh, tens of terabytes of data have been donated. Hundreds of millions of spectra have been searched. And so we, we think, based on the tools, there's roughly one million distinct human peptides have been identified by a mass spectrometer. There's, of course, also for some of you who follow this, this field, there have been two uh, papers, there are kind of landmark papers in the field, where two groups reported in Nature, uh, end of 14, 
that they had a draft map of the human proteome and they reported various numbers of proteins in the range of 18 to 18 and a half thousand, which is fairly close to the roughly 20,000 ORFs that the human proteome uh, contains based on genome annotation. So we then compared, and there's now a fairly interesting debate in the field, we compared this data in these papers with the community-based data that have been donated to the Peptide Atlas database. And, we, and uh, this has been analyzed with various tools in various ways. And, well, and this is kind of a consensus representation of the shotgun discovery state of the human proteome today. Again, there's a lot of debate about this, and I'm just stating uh, some of what is somewhat of a consensus, and I then point again to this issue of protein inference. So what is clear is that these data sets that were generated uh, contribute in the number of identified peptides. So now clearly we've reached about a million, which I already said, and we can see that these very large data sets from the Pande lab, Küster lab, Mirsai lab, uh, also a very large coordinated effort of cancer proteomics in the US, CPTAC, they all contribute to some extent newly new peptides in the sense that they find peptides no one else has been finding before. And that is fairly well controlled at the level of the false discovery rate. And then when we ask what proteins do these million or so peptides represent, we see that the number of new proteins discovered is becoming very, very small. Now, uh, we, we think, that is the, what the tools tell us, that roughly at uh, 14,500 or so proteins, the discovery effort caps out. And this is based on some models which take these million peptides and try to infer which proteins are, re are, um, are represented by these peptides. Now, individual papers that have been published cite higher numbers from exactly the same data or a subset of the data. And there's not that these scientists made, did something wrong or that they made uh, somewhere a mistake. It simply indicates that there is different ways how one can co compute the proteins that are represented by a number of peptides. There's also, of course, issues about error control and so which I don't want to get into. But in, in essence, we, it seems that right now we know from the human proteome roughly some 14 and a half thousand proteins that it is very difficult by doing the same thing shotgun sequencing or over and over again it's very difficult to find to identify a higher number of proteins so for instance here millions of spectra were added to the known field of uh, knowledge of proteome and they identified four or 30 or three additional proteins which is of course on the background of 10,000 or 14,000, very, very little, and is well within the error rate of the assessment tools. So, um, we don't, so the situation with the human proteome right now is, which is an important discussion from the point of view of having the aspiration to be an omics technology, we can say we are not an omics technology. We have not the ability to cover all proteins, but about two thirds or three quarters of the annotated ORFs have been reliably identified with enormous effort. Some of these papers cited tens of thousands of LCM SMS runs. And so we have discovered uh, a fairly sizable fraction, but not all of the proteins, at least in the human. And so the, we think that uh, it, there is merit to go and have the whole proteome represented at the level of fragment ion spectra. But then what one would might to have to use a different strategy and we proposed a targeting strategy to go after the other 5,000 or so proteins and simply to synthesize these proteins in the form of peptides, generate reference spectra, and then do targeted searching for these spectra in suitable samples to see which additional proteins actually are accessible by proteomics. Okay, so this is the one, the one branch of this discussion, and that is how many proteins can we actually see in the best possible case with a mass spectrometer? And so we said this about 75% of the annotated ORFs. Now we can ask, what does this actually do to biological studies? And this is, um, again, the citation is cut off here. This is 
from a paper, a uh, fascinating paper by Al Edwards, uh, who is in Toronto, and uh, does, does a lot of meta-analysis of data that are in the literature. So what Al did here is he said, uh, he wrote a paper and did first analysis and then wrote the paper, of course. He asked, what is the impact of genomics or proteomics on the landscape of life science publications? So he basically calculated an impact factor of, uh, in the literature of proteins or, or, or their corresponding genes. And the way he did that, he basically counted uh, for every protein how often does this protein or the corresponding gene show up in a scientific publication that is published in, in any one of the uh, thousands of journals. And so then he based this, then he, he, he made these plots. This is for protein kinases, but the same would be true for any other protein class. And what the blue, and he did it over two time periods, two decades, one decade before the genome, human genome was known, and one decade after. So one would expect that if the knowledge of this, all the ORFs and the knowledge of the, all the genes in principle would lead to a transformation of how life sciences do research, in other words, in what, what part of the genome or protein they, function, uh, they, they focus on when they do functional analysis, that there would be a significant shift. And there isn't. So the blue curve is the, is, is, uh, the, the decades before the genome was known. So we have uh, clearly a number of protein kinases, by implication other proteins, that are highly cited, that appear in a lot of, pro a lot of papers, and these are the proteins that are studied in great detail by a lot of bio biologists. Then you have a very large tail here of protein kinases, this is about 500 in the case of human, where, where there's virtually nothing known, they're not studied, they don't show up in the literature. So interestingly enough, then the, the, the time between 2000 and 2009 is the, the citations are in the, uh, the red ones here, and we see exactly or largely the same distribution. We see again a number of proteins studied extensively, we see some new ones pop up, and but there's relatively few, and most out here still are basically obscure. They're not studied, there's no reports, and that of course doesn't mean they're not biologically relevant. It just means no one has bothered actually doing something about these proteins. So the upshot is that the uh, impact of genomics and proteomics in the, in the impact on the life science literature has been actually fairly moderate. So the questions would be why has this happened? Why has proteomics not impacted more strongly on the protein that is being reported in papers if in now in principle we know every protein? We could in principle say I want to study a class of protein kinases uh, because we have maybe some hints from cancer genomics or from GWA studies that they are really important but that hasn't really happened yet. So Al concluded here, this is the conclusion that he drew from this meta-analysis that new findings are reported predominantly on those proteins that are routinely measurable in many laboratories, that is those for which antibodies are available. So this is an interesting finding, right, because he basically says scientists, of which there is many thousands, will largely study those things which are basically <coughs> ready to be measurable, which of course makes sense because we cannot really study something which is not measurable, and that the real constraint is not the, in the biological interest or significant of the, of the pr respective proteins, but our ability to measure them. And most of these measurements reported in these life science papers are based on some antibody that you can order and then do a Western blot or an ELISA test. So this is basically the ambition of targeted proteomics to change this to make essentially any protein measurable and to remove this constraint of available uh, measurement and quantification reagents and to make in principle any protein measurable and to then have to bi the biology drive which proteins are measured and not the availability of a reagent. So that's the conclusion of the uh, discovery proteomics in its impact that we are able to measure about with or have discovered about three quarters of the human proteome, that these three quarters of proteins are measurable uh, for sure, 
biomass spectrometer because they have been credibly identified, but that this ability has not really translated yet significantly into, uh, into the scientific literature, a part of the core proteomics papers, of course, and that we think that through targeting this can be changed because every protein, in principle, should be measurable. So now I'm coming to this uh, rationale here and the implementation of targeting. This is exactly the, 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 the situation I just cited, based on this analysis from Al Edwards and others. Uh, similar considerations well, is the motivation for us to, tar to establish targeting mass spectrometry to make basically a larger uh, subset of the proteome reliably measurable at, at a high reproducibility and high quant quantitative accuracy. So the idea came up a while back um, to use these proteome maps uh, that have been generated now where millions of spectra are clearly described and are sitting in a database to use this as prior information to do more efficient proteomic experiments. Even to this day, it is a sizable effort to do discovery proteomics on, on 10,000 or so proteins. And usually a, lot, a large number of runs have to be done. And we, we would like to uh, basically use prior information from discovery proteomics to derive, uh, um, to, to use this information to do measurements that are directed at specific proteins, which is biology driven, to learn new biology. So if we look how biologists or scientists in general um, learn new biology, I think there is currently two big areas, or I call them here worlds, or basically large communities that pursue certain directions. And the two, as, as also is apparent from Al Edwards' analysis, do largely not intersect. So we have the big data world where scientists try to work with large data sets. So you know certainly about cancer genomics or, or transcriptomics or genome-wide association studies, large-scale large proteomic or metabolomic studies. So these are all cases or instances where scientists think if we generate a large amount of data on a particular, around a particular question, we can then use this data to use some form of statistical model and to eventually learn new information. So this is not the majority of scientists. This is probably the minority, but there, of course, it's a fairly interesting community because they do a lot of very interesting stuff and some interesting findings come out. We should realize, however, that most of these findings that come out from this big data world are not actually mechanistically substantiated facts. They usually are, are statements that come from some form of associa associa statistical association, which, which basically says, if this happens, this happens. So for instance, if, if, if 100 people have cancer, then uh, they, we have found a set of genes that are always upregulated or mutated in the case where these patients have cancer. And this is not, of course, a causal relationship. It simply states that there is a, an association or correlation. The really, the really mechanistic understanding comes from the much larger biology or life science community, the, which we can call reductionist world or, or mechanistic-based world, which f focus on specific molecules and try to piece together how certain processes function from mechanistic models, structural biology, biochemistry, cell biology, and so on. So this would, be the, this would be the labs that would take a particular protein, make a mutation, express this protein, and, and, see, and then see what happens. And I, th and I think um, what, what really is interesting in the current state, uh, especially from the field of proteomics, is that proteomics can really form an, an interface or the measurement of proteins for both this or an interface between this reductionist world and the big data world if we can control, do controlled and quantitative measurements of certain sets of proteins in a highly reproducible fashion. Which is and that the selection of proteins measurable are not limited by some available reagent. So we, we would here of course try to measure thousands or 5,000 or 10,000 of proteins, ideally all the proteins. Here we might do measurements of only a few, relatively 
few, maybe 10 or 20 or 50 proteins, but do it under many conditions. So targeted proteomics, we think, is a suitable tool to serve both of these communities, because now methods have been developed uh, that, like the DIA methods that do this uh, type of measurements as a, as a big data, in a big data situation. And other methods, targeting methods, have been developed, uh, such as SRM or PRM, that are serving this um, reductionist community extremely well. The principle is the same, the scope is somewhat different. So, we, what we're really, uh, I think, talking about in this targeting field is that we would like to generate data which are basically a matrix and not a list. From the, do from the discovery mass spectrometry um, methods, we are usually used and there's been enormous focus on generating lists where from one or a few samples, maybe two or three samples, maybe ten, uh, proteins were identified and as many proteins as possible. And so this is of course useful because it gives us an inventory of these samples. From the, f from the point of view of understanding how a particular process functions, this is not super useful to just know its inventory. So we would assume that if we can measure a certain number of proteins very precisely and reliably across uh, many conditions, for instance in, the, in patient cohorts in the case of medicine, or in perturbed states where for instance we we'll do time courses, or dosage courses, or measure uh, systematically the effect of gene knockouts on a particular cell or tissue. Then one would uh, find information that is not easily accessible before, that is really in this, da in this big data world where one could use uh, um, correlative analysis or other machine learning or network biology tools to learn hopefully new insights. And to generate, to generate these data matrices in proteomics is exceedingly challenging. So we have been doing very well, and I described this before, in, in identifying long lists of credibly identified proteins, although some, some problems remain, which I try to discuss very briefly. If we want to do this, however, hundreds of times, then we run into trouble. And this has been one of the Achilles heels, I think, of proteomics that has limited its penetration into uh, the gen generic life science mainstream research is the ability to generate such data sets where we don't just identify large numbers of proteins but do it consistently and quantify them consistently across very large cohorts. This is clearly already possible in the genomics world through next generation sequencing but it has been difficult in the field of proteomics. So why has it been so difficult? This is a proteome as seen by a bottom-up mass spectrometry uh, setup so the each dot here is a peptide <coughs> that is detected <coughs> as a precursor by a mass spectrometer. There's a dimension here, this is the retention time chromatography dimension, and there is the precursor mass dimension, <coughs> basically the mass of the intact peptide ions. And we see that there's a lot of peptides. We of course cannot count them because it's basically black here. We don't know how many are on top of each other. But we can make some extrapolations. We can say, well, let's assume we work with the human proteome. Let's say we apply some rules how this proteome has been digested. Let's make some rules how, how certain peptides might be modified and so on, and in fact, they're in splice forms. And then one would end up with a very large number of these peptides. So the assumption would be, it's, and this is no, uh, these are certainly not fixed numbers, but we would assume that it could be like millions, maybe 10 million, maybe up to 100 million such peptides are being generated if we digest a, a proteome. Now whether it's 10 million or 100 million doesn't really matter. It's a very large number compared to the sequencing cycles of the mass spectrometer. So a typical high, even highly scanning, fast scanning mass spectrometer will over the duration of such an experiment here, a measurement, chromatographic retention time, may be select for fragmentation in the range of a few tens to hundred thousand or so precursors. So this is a s relatively small fraction of the total precursors present. And that's as, of course, this is a well-documented fact now, that this leads to a lot of precursors not being selected for fragmentation. This is simply a, a color coding 
of actual real data where a sample has been analyzed. Uh, the, the black dots are the precursors detected. The blue dots are the precursors that the mass spectrometer attempts to sequence in a DDA mode. And the red dot features are those that have been identified with a high probability. So this looks actually quite good here, but when we start to zoom in into a relatively busy area, we see that only a fraction of the detected precursors was selected, and not all precursors selected was correctly identified. So this is um, the various forms of such figures have been have been generated is a well-known fact, a well-known docu documented fact. The implication simply is that if you want to do, generate such a data matrix where, where the same or similar uh, samples are measured many times over, uh, then we run into trouble because we, don't, we have very little control which of these precursors are actually selected in a particular sample. And so the upshot, the upshot of this is, the practical upshot, is that we generate data with many missing values. If these are again conditions versus proteins, if we use the conventional DDA method, and we would like to have something like that with very few missing values. And we believe, and I think that's the underlying assumption of targeting, that this can be achieved, such data matrices can be achieved with any one of the targeting methods that we discussed this week. And they of course differ in the length of this list that can be identified. SRM or MRM would be a relatively short list, maybe 50 to 100 proteins. Uh, PRM may be a bit longer and DIA methods can be go quite long. So the transition is not necessarily one that we would uh, stress is in terms of the protein lists being generated. It is in the consistency of analysis and the, 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 the thrust or the aim to generate such data with many samples have been analyzed with relatively de relative depth on but with, with a high uh, reproducibility and consistency. So now um, if this, this states the goal and this is the realistic assumption you will see that this is largely achievable through the tools you will and data acquisition uh, methods and tools you will hear about. And now the question of course is how do we translate the information in these proteomic maps that initially I discussed into, uh, into such uh, data sets here with very few missing values. And so I think it's easy to follow the or to use the analogy of fingerprints and individuals. So these individuals will put the, anal the analogy of proteins in a population. Each one is slightly different but they have of course some resemblance but they can be distinguished by a representative measurement, if you want, and that is a fingerprint. So if we know, if we have a library of fingerprints where each person of this population is registered in a computer, we could go any place, measure fingerprints, and then associate the fingerprint with the library and say this person was at a particular time at this location. So we can basically identify the person. This is of course done every day in forensics and in, in many other fields as well. Now we would like to just do this also for proteomics and the fingerprint is of course a fragment ion spectrum of a peptide of which we have millions in these databases that I described like Peptide Atlas or the MaxQuant database or uh, there's a whole range uh, of database, such databases in, in existence or being built up. Uh, Brandon in Seattle is building uh, such a database and data repository. The EBI has been building a very extensive repository of spectra. And so we, we can assume that eventually uh, for every protein and more specifically for every meaningful peptide such spectra exist which we can basically consider as fingerprints. And so this is the idea of targeting. We would use prior information uh, from these fingerprints we would then basically use them in a device, which is in our case a mass spectrometer, to associate with the pre its presence in a particular population or sample. And this is uh, the idea of targeting. And this was uh, in 13, I believe, the named method of the year of uh, by the journal Nature Nature Methods. Not super meaningful, but uh, but it, it it shows that I think the life science community in general saw that 
there is a way forward of using mass spectrometry probably in more effective ways than it has been used in the past, not with respect to uh, mapping out a proteome, but translating these proteome maps into biological knowledge. So this um, is what we're talking about in specific, in, in specifically, uh, this is really the essence of targeting. We have a reference spectrum, which is prior information. We know of this reference spectrum a lot. We know it's a uh, fragment ion uh, mass. We know the relative intensity of fragment ions. We know when this peptide dilutes. We know um, a lot of other, other things about the spectra. So the idea is that we now go and we tell the mass spectrometer to specifically look for this particular peptide using this prior information and in the most simple case of SRM, uh, selected reaction monitoring, this is done by telling the mass spectrometer to all throughout his whole the whole uh, chromatographic illusion time to always select this precursor peptide based on its precursor mass and then to fragment whatever is in that window here, which is usually a narrow window of about 1.7 to 1 mass unit, and then to record from these fragments all only the fragment ions that are meaningful from this from this uh, spectrum and basically to generate a series of ion chromatograms where each curve here represents to the chromatog chromatographic illusion profile of one of these fragment ions that is uniquely associated with the particular precursor. And then we can score this, we can say we have we expect to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or whatever number of fragment ions which have precise mass, which concurrently elute, the apex is, has to be identical because they're all derived from the same precursor. And the relative intensity has to have a certain, uh, a certain proportionality. Uh, the widths have to have a certain, uh, certain width, and we can define a number of factors which can be used as scores for analysis tools that you will, that you will work with to say, if we have such a peak, a group of peaks, each peak representing the fragment ion of a precursor peptide that we want to target, we can be very confident that this peptide that we targeted is present, or if the signals do not appear, is not present in, the, in this sample. That's basically the intent, and um, the difficult, the difference, the principal difference in peptide ident identification, DDA, and targeting is that we determine the best match between the spectrum and the database, and then we determine whether the best match is true in DDA, and that creates uh, fairly interesting, uh, complicated <coughs> statistical issues, and this is reflected in the discussion I had, uh, I had just a few minutes ago with the saturation of proteome coverage. In targeting, we, we, we basically test a hypothesis that the peak group representing a targeted peptide is in the is in the data set. So it's a completely different question. It's a completely different mindset. And we use we have the benefit of really having uh, prior information to get fairly conclusive answers to this to this hypothesis we are testing for each peptide that we want to test. Now there is of course also statistical issues about false discovery rate, error propagation and so on. But and, and this will be discussed extensively this this week. But I think it's important to notice that we are doing something quite different. Uh, even though we use the same samples, to some extent the mass spectrometer, but the, the question, uh, the, the, the scientific question, is a different one, and this has implications for the tools and the conclusions that we draw. So in reality, this, looks, this is how this looks like. Now we talked about some kind of general principles. This is data that I probably Lucas uh, Reiter will will discuss. This is data they generated uh, uh, in, in their laboratory. And this is uh, by, a, by a DIA method, data independent analysis method called, they call hyper uh, reaction monitoring. It's basically a massively expansion of, uh, of SRM. And basically what they did here is to run exactly the same sample uh, 25 times or 24 times and they asked if they use the shotgun method in exactly the same instrument, uh, just operated in two different modes. Once in DDA mode, once in DIA mode, which is a massively parallel targeting method. 
And so they basically asked, what is the proteins or peptides that are identified by either method across these 24 repeat injections? So this now addresses the question of repeatability or reproducibility. So we see here that uh, the blue is the peptides identified by, by DDA. And we see that it's quite high. And then it decays. So this means that the here we have would have about 10,000 or 8,000 peptides identified in 9 out of 24 runs. One, uh, about 15 or 18,000 are identified in one run. And about uh, no, 5, 6,000 peptides were identified across all 24. So we see this typical decay curve of proteins or peptides consistently identified. This is reflected in this leaky uh, in, this, in this matrix. These are the number of repeat analysis. Uh, these are the, the proteins or peptides. And we see uh, exactly as you would expect from this sampling method a number of uh, blind spots, peptides not identified in every run. This is the data on the, on the HRM or DIA. And first of all, it's more consistent. It does not decay to the same extent. And it, it is also actually high. This was actually a surprise to me, uh, but that the numbers in general are higher. What is not a surprise is that they stay up uh, so, so high consistently throughout. That's reflected in this data matrix, where again, repeat analysis versus peptides, you have relatively few missing values. So this is the, this is the uh, conceptual difference between the two methods. And this is the upshot from the point of view of measurements. In this is it clearly in the measurement of big data domain, where we can do multiple repeats over uh, or with a complex sample with fairly high number of proteins identified. Exactly the same we can do for the more me mechanism or driven analysis by, for instance, SRM or, hyper or, or, or PRM, where the number of proteins monitored would be relatively small, but nevertheless, they can monitor and measure with high reproducibility. So this is a summary of this part. Now, uh, of course, I'm running late. Um, Discovery Proteomics has su successfully mapped the proteome with minimal up imp with relatively minimal impact in, pro in, in biology. This is based statement is based on Al Edwards meta-analysis. For reductionist and big data studies, the reproducible and accurate measurement of proteins is a critical requirement. And targeting MS in various forms supports this reproducibility. I think this is the this is the big the biggest advance. Now I'm of course running late and now I'm thinking what I should do with the last few slides. So I go through in an abbreviated version. And I wanted to this has been just basically laying out the scene. Now I would like to show a few data that really test the question whether we can in the real world detect and quantify any protein, uh, whether we can do it reproducibly and accurately, and whether we can do it across laboratories. It is somewhat useful if uh, within one laboratory reproducible measurements can be done over hundreds of runs. This is an achievement, but it is even better achievement if we generated data here we could send this data over to someone in another laboratory and they could use this basically as a base to do comparative analysis in a, in based on the data. So basically cross-laboratory would be nice. <coughs> this issue of reproducibility is an is extremely important issue. This, of course, <coughs> uh, for those who read the literature, not just the research papers, but also commentaries and so on, they know uh, by now that this is extremely hot issue and I think a serious threat to science um, as we as we practice it. So this is a uh, study show that 10% of published science articles are reproducible. This is not something I made up. This is a headline from one of these commentaries. So this is ex very, very extensively discussed in a very high level journals such as Nature Publishing Group. They have whole strings of articles around this issue. So now what does this mean? This doesn't mean that 90% of scientists don't know what they're doing. It also doesn't mean that 90% of scientists are cheating and make stuff up. So it simply means that there is, uh, there's a, in the whole process of doing experiments, there is weak points which add to variability of, of research results. So why is this important? This is important because if in, in financially 
tough times, which you kind of live in, it is very easy for politicians to say, well, to go to funding agencies and say, look, uh, only 90, or to put it negatively, 90% of the stuff produced with the research money that we put into these funding agencies is basically worthless because it cannot be reproduced. And the reproducibility is, of course, one of the cornerstones of, of experimental science. So I think this is a really important issue. And I think from the point of view, um, it be of the point of view of also science policy, but also, of course, from the scientific point of view, it is it's ex essential that we would analyze uh, where do, do things fail. And we think that in the field of proteomics, which has a big role to play, as I tried to explain in small scale experiments, but also in large scale big data type experiments, reproducibility is addressed. So we, this is from a paper in Nature that came out uh, a while back where they analyzed this, the various steps and they actually did a good job and saying reproducibility is as such not really an issue by itself. It has many different aspects and they, 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 they tease it apart in saying reproducibility depends on the design of experiments, reagents, drugs, cells and so on. So for instance, if someone buys an antibody, does the antibody actually recognize what it's supposed to, to recognize? In, it has to do with data acquisition, with statistics validation, and so on. And from the discussion we just had now, we think that in, the, in here, reagents, that is the assays to measure proteins, data acquisition, highly reproducible acquisition of data across many samples, statistics, how we analyze this data. These are all issues that are directly relevant to proteomics and that are directly relevant to be addressed and can be addressed quite well, I'm not saying perfectly, but quite well, by targeting uh, MS methods at a smaller scale, but also at a, large, at a larger scale. So data acquisition is clearly a big issue, and we hope that uh, you will, will find through this week that if we acquire data in a targeting mode, with the tools available that you learn how to use, we can actually generate data that are highly reproducible across large numbers of samples, but also across laboratories. So, um, skip that. Just this, basically the last two slides I want to show is we tested this to some extent. So what, we, what I mean here with testing is we try to set up a study that involves multiple laboratories and we wanted to test whether a specific implementation of the DIA method is this tar tar uh, massively parallel targeting method allows us and our colleagues to generate data in different laboratories that are essentially comparable. Uh, and so this is the study design. We generated here a, uh, a test sample that is the lysate of a human cell line, HEC-293. It's actually the sample was uh, mostly in the study was mostly run by Ben Collins here, so you can ask him all about the details. In this lysate, we added 30 peptides that were uh, isotopically labeled at, at various quantities. So we generated basically <coughs> um, a number of samples, five samples, that have different levels of these isotopic labeled peptides and that collectively span about six orders of magnitude uh, from 12 atomol to 10 picomol of these of the synthetic peptides, always in the same background of the HEC-293 lysate. So these are a number of samples that were generated and then we, uh, we f could find uh, a total of 11 groups, this is just listed here, where they are, around the world who agreed to run these samples, sent to them by mail, in at a certain schedule in the laboratory. So the, they were they, co they committed to running on day one, let's say a Monday, a Wednesday and a Friday of the same week. These samples in a certain order. So this would be seven samples per lab run three times a week. And the order was such that this should allow us to then when we get the data to look how reproducible are these uh, data within the same laboratory within a day in the same instrument across uh, the l across the days in the same laboratory and across laboratories uh, that participate. So we can basically ask 
how variable or, how, how, or more optimistically how consistent are the data in terms of proteins identified and quantified uh, within one instrument in a day, across a week, and across uh, laboratories. So the, the data were then all sent here back, and then Ben has analyzed this data. And this is um, one, one question we wanted to ask, and that is, how consistently do laboratories identify proteins? So which, what we see here is blocks, unfortunately it's cut off, but we see blocks, each block here would be one laboratory, this is clearly one, this is another one, and here is the number of proteins that they, they identified or detected. So what we see is that it's a reasonably large number uh, of somewhere between four and a half and five thousand proteins. I think the latest number are even slightly higher, but it doesn't really matter. And we see that the different laboratories are not all exactly the same. This is, of course, no surprise, because you would assume that uh, if some instrument has been uh, just cleaned and is in peak performance, it will do very well, and then over time, it goes, the performance goes down a little. So we clearly see that they do generally quite well, but not exactly identical, which is, which is uh, to be expected. The really important issue is this red curve here. This is an accumulation curve, and basically uh, asks the question that if you go down to here, which is roughly 100 LCMSMS runs, and you add another 50 uh, anal data from another 50 analysis, how many additional peptides or proteins do these 50 additional runs or 100 additional runs actually contribute? And we see they contribute very, very few. So this is extremely encouraging because it means that even though there is some differences between this group here and this group here, or, the, or their mass spectrometer, it is, it is not so, it does not mean that they identify um, that these are different proteins no one else has seen before. So basically we, we have an issue of consistency that, that is indicated by this accumulation curve that whatever proteins are seen by any one of the laboratories are likely also to be seen by the others and some may see a few, le a few less because maybe they, some are in the noise, but they don't see different proportions or different, uh, different segments of the proteome as it is clearly always present or apparent in the, in the accumulation runs in the, uh, in, the, in the DDA measurements as I also showed with the graph before. So I think what we can conclude, and I, there's, some, there's also some data on the actual dilution curve limit of detection and, and, um, and um, and linearity of response, I skip over that for reason of time, but I think what we can conclude is if we look at this group of this scheme from nature where they try to tease apart the issue of reproducibility in experimental design, in data acquisition, in data analysis and, and other factor statistics that proteomics now has in a small scale by the PRM and SRM methods but in large scale also by the DIA methods, of which there's now several, has the ability to pr clearly produce across laboratories highly reproducible data, not of the whole proteome, but of those proteins that are actually covered and detected. The data are highly reproducible at the detection, but also the quantification range. So that's the um, summary. I basically said that already, and therefore I conclude. And thank you for your attention, for showing up at the course, and I hope particularly that you have an interesting uh, week and that you learn a lot, that uh, what you learn you will be able to use also in your research when you go home. So uh, I conclude here. I'm happy to answer some questions or maybe you're more hungry for food than for, uh, for answers, which is also fine with me. <laughs>